recently on the Casual Shenanigans Gaming Podcast, Evil Viking 13 and myself received a challenge. Co-host Joel told us that he thinks it's impossible to build a PC for the price of a PlayStation 4 that will perform as well and last as long as a console. Joel said that even if the PC could play modern games now, it wouldn't be able to keep up as the PlayStation platform became more developed and as developers became better at putting their games on the new consoles. Evil Viking 13 and I thought that we could definitely build a gaming PC that could keep up with the console and accepted the challenge. Now before we go too far, I should tell you that this is a pretty long video, so look at the description if you want links to the different comparisons and reviews and you can jump around and watch whatever you want. Uh, other than that, let's get going. We settled on $350 as our budget, as that's about what a used but good condition PlayStation 4 is selling for these days. Used parts, sales, and rebates were fine, but they all had to be in good condition and parts that the average consumer could purchase themselves. Any parts that we already owned were fine to use, but we had to add their values to the budget. An operating system was not included in the budget, as you would have the choice of running a spare copy of Windows, SteamOS, Linux, or anything else that you wanted. I chose an old Windows 7 Pro license I had laying around. We also decided that we didn't need a disk drive. The Blu-ray drive of the PlayStation 4 is a great feature and is necessary if you want to purchase physical console games, but PC games are almost entirely downloaded these days, so we didn't need to match that particular feature. After a few weeks of discussion and research, we finalized the parts list and ordered everything. Here's what we picked and why. Up first is the case. We went with a Cooler Master Wave Master. Uh, used price of this is about $10. We actually got it for free because Casual Shenanigans member Debbie had an old one laying around from an old computer build of hers and she let us have it for free. But our rule is any free parts we get, we still add what they are worth into the overall budget. Up next is the CPU. We went with an Intel i5-750. That's a first generation i5 processor. Four cores, no hyper-threading, supposed to be a decent overclocker, which is good because it comes stock clocked at 2.66 gigahertz, and we were able to pick one up used for $55. We knew we'd have to skimp out on the fan a little bit, but we were able to get an Arctic Silver 11 GT on sale for $6, brand new. Uh, it's a pretty basic cooler. It's a little bit beefier than the stock Intel cooler, but it certainly isn't a Hyper G12 or any other really impressive air cooler, so this is going to hurt our overclocking a little bit. Next is the motherboard. Uh, for price reasons, we had to go with an ASUS P7H55. Now, the H55 chipset uh, is not the great overclocking chipset, but we should be able to get a little bit of an overclock out of this build. Uh, but to fit it within our budget, we had to go with this board. Now, it does have four RAM slots, a bunch of USB 2 ports, and other nice stuff like that. Even on a budget build, you need a high quality power supply to ensure that you're gonna have a reliable power throughput to all of your important components to avoid damage and to help with stability. We were able to get a brand new EVGA 430 watt power supply for $15 after some mail-in rebates. So that's a pretty awesome deal all the way around. Memory is an area where we are sure that we are making a choice we're going to regret at some point, but you have to cut corners in a couple places, and we ended up cutting corners on the memory. I really, really wanted 6 to 8 gigabytes of memory, but we had to go with 4 gigabytes. We just couldn't afford 8. Now, 4 gigabytes is perfectly fine for pretty much any game that's come out in the past couple years, but as time goes on, I'm sure this is going to become a limitation of this build, and we'll be keeping an eye on it. Uh, next is the hard drive. I ended up going with a 320 gigabyte Samsung spin point, and I know that's not as big as the 500 gigabyte hard drive that comes in the PS4, but really for this build, it doesn't matter. Uh, I had a spare 320 gigabyte laying around. It's worth about $20. I ended up putting it in the computer because we're not going to need all 500 gigabytes in this particular build uh, because I'm only going to be installing a couple games at a time for testing. So I just used what I had available and added what it's worth to the price. Now you could get a 500 gig hard drive for the exact same amount of money of similar quality if you were buying it yourself. So that's why we went with that. Up last is the GPU, debatably the most important part of any gaming build and certainly a budget build. This is where you can hopefully overcome some limitations in your memory and CPU. And uh, we actually were able to get really lucky. We were able to buy a brand new MSI GTX 760 on sale for $140, no rebate. Um, this is a pretty decent card and we think this is probably just what we need in order to stay competitive in the gaming market. All of that comes out to a grand total of $356. So we did blow our budget by uh, six bucks. That wasn't intentional when we initially set it up. Um, it so happened that 
you know, just based on shipping and other things, it came out to $356. Not included in that price list, uh, but included in the actual budget was a generic mouse and keyboard uh, for $13, wireless Logitech mouse and keyboard. Um, I didn't include them in here just because that's no one cares about that, but we did factor it into the budget and a couple miscellaneous cables and things that we needed. So there you go, $356, and we've decided on the name The Potato Masher. Now this is a little bit tongue in cheek, uh, of course the goal is not to poke fun at consoles nonstop, but we thought it was fine if the name did that just a little bit, we thought it was pretty funny, uh, and so here you have it, the Potato Masher. I decided to start with some synthetic benchmarks, not because they're the be-all to end-all of graphics comparisons, but it's a good way to compare relative performance of the same computer after overclocking, and to compare that computer to a more powerful or less powerful computer to see how its relative performance might stack up. Now, synthetic benchmarks are not real-world benchmarks, so you should not take them just by themselves, but they are a good tool in your overall benchmarking of a new gaming PC. So, I started with 3 Mark Vantage. Now for the synthetic benchmarks, I'll be comparing the Potato Masher against my personal computer, which isn't top of the line technically, but it still can play all new games at very high resolutions, at great frame rates, so I would consider it to be a high-end gaming desktop. It has an i5-3570K overclocked to 4.5 GHz, and it has an AMD R9-290 graphics card. So in 3D Mark Vantage, the Potato Masher at its stock clock speed of 2.66 GHz on the processor turning a score of 21,678. Overclocked to 3.7 GHz, it turned in a score of 24,920, which would indicate that the processor is either bottlenecking the graphics card when it's at its stock clocks, or that 3D Mark Vantage uh, is a little more CPU dependent than some of the benchmarks that come after it. Uh, by reference, my personal computer got a score of 34,659. So the Potato Masher, at least in 3D Mark Vantage, isn't really all that far behind, uh, especially when overclocked. It looks like it's probably 80 to 85% of my personal computer when it comes to gaming. Up next is 3D Mark 11, run at 720p resolution and on the performance setting. Uh, the Potato Masher at its stock clocks got a score of 7,211. Uh, overclocked to 3.7 GHz, it got a score of 7,709. Uh, and then my personal computer got a score of 12,888 which would seem to indicate uh, that there's more of a gap between these two computers than uh, 3D Mark Vantage would indicate. And it may be because 3D Mark 11 uses more advanced rendering, um, uses DirectX 11 features, uh, it just has more high-end graphics features that our GTX 760 may not be able to keep up with an R9 290 quite as well. Another very graphics-intensive benchmark is Unigen Heaven, also run uh, at pretty much stock settings except tessellation and anti-aliasing are turned all the way up. Uh, the Potato Masher at its stock clock's got a score of 792, overclocked to 3.7 GHz, it got a score of 808, which is really barely any improvement, indicating that uh, Unigen Heaven does not rely on the CPU all that much. Uh, and then my personal computer got a score of 1515, um, which again would indicate that Unigen Heaven is very graphics intensive. Lastly, I wanted to see how much overclocking actually gained us on raw CPU performance, so I used one of my favorite CPU-only benchmarks, uh, Cinebench 11 in multi-threaded mode. The Potato Masher at stock clocks got a 3.67, overclocked to 3.7 gigahertz, it got a 4.8, and then my computer turned in a score of 7.34, which would certainly indicate that the i5-750 is definitely a couple generations behind the 3570K. Um, it definitely does not have anywhere close to the amount of rendering power, but I don't think this is gonna matter that much for gaming. Like, this isn't a, uh, you know, video production machine predominantly, although I think it could still do a pretty decent job at it. Um, and, you know, of course, my 3570K is by no means the latest cutting edge processor, but it's still very, very good, and it has yet to meet a game that really pushed it that far. Alright, let's start the game benchmarks with DayZ. Now, if you really want to view these comparisons properly, uh, you need to look at the source files because YouTube kind of ruins the video quality, even if you're watching at 1080p. So, I will provide links in the description of this video 
uh, where you can watch this video in the original upload quality. Now this will be hosted as long as I can possibly host it um, and hopefully you guys will be able to take a look at that if you really want to pixel peep. Now if you just want to get an overall idea and you trust what I'm telling you then you are of course welcome to just keep watching this on YouTube as is. Uh, now Daisy is a great looking game depending on what your style is but overall I think it's a very nice looking game but it's not always a great performing game when you're out running in the wilderness it generally looks pretty good and runs pretty well um, no major issues now you have to remember this is a alpha game so of course it's not optimized like the final release will be uh, but when you're running around in the wilderness um, I was able to get 60 FPS at times uh, with everything on the highest settings except for anti-aliasing I normally keep on low with a little FXAA thrown in there um, but the real story with Daisy is not the wilderness where it runs pretty well it's the cities and as you get closer to the cities the frame rate drops and drops and drops and uh, it's not because of the graphics card and it's kind of because of your CPU but not really it's really a bottleneck on the games uh, side you know it's something to do with the server and the way the server handles all the objects uh, and there's nothing really you can do about it but you can lower your graphic settings all the way down and it will give you a little bit of a frame rate boost but I don't think it's worth it personally I'd rather play it kind of choppy frame rate like everyone else and have the game still look really good and have long sight lines and good view distances uh, but overall this performs pretty much as well as it does on my computer which is more to say that Daisy is not well optimized yet, but if you want the quintessential Daisy experience, you can have it on the Potato Masher. Dark Souls 2 is another game that I cannot show you a comparison with the PlayStation 4 uh, because it's not out on the PlayStation 4 yet. Now it is coming out on the PlayStation 4 and I may do a comparison at that point, but for right now it is last gen and PC only. Uh, now this is actually a really great port and it runs very very smoothly it runs at a very very smooth 60 FPS at all times uh, with everything turned all the way up to ultra at 1080p uh, and it actually was running so well I decided to see if I could make use of Nvidia's dynamic super resolution if you don't know what that is basically the game renders at a higher resolution than your screen can display and then is downsampled which means it just shrinks the image down and shows it on your screen this makes textures and models look a little bit sharper and can actually remove the need for a lot of anti-aliasing because it's essentially accomplishing the same thing that anti-aliasing sets out to do. It's a pretty cool feature, but of course you need to be able to run the game very well for it to work. Well, Dark Souls 2 runs so well that we are actually able to play the game at 4K 60fps downsampled to 1080p. Yes, that's right, the Potato Masher for $350 is running Dark Souls 2 at 4K 60fps. So, let's just get those jokes out of the way right now. Yes, it will run Crisis, Crisis 3 specifically. If you're wondering why I didn't test the original Crisis, well, it's about seven years old now, and is that really a relevant comparison? But Crisis 3 runs very, very nicely on the Potato Masher. Uh, it runs with everything maxed out, as you can see on screen. The game looks absolutely gorgeous, and I'm getting a steady 30 plus frames per second. Interestingly, uh, the game is actually V-Synced, but it seems content to run at just above 30, and I experienced this on my personal computer too, even V-Synced, with a monitor with a refresh rate of 60 Hz, the game would actually run closer to 70, or that's what DXTory was reporting, so that, I don't know if that's a bug in the game or not, but uh, regardless, it looks great and plays very, very smoothly. Now, this is just recorded from the first sections of the game, but when you do get outside a little bit later on in the game into the more jungle-like areas, no spoilers, uh, it still does look great. The performance doesn't seem to suffer much, um, but if you want a guaranteed rock solid experience, you can drop some of the features from ultra down to just very high. But as you can see, this is an absolutely amazing looking game and uh, you can have this experience on the Potato Masher. Arma 3 is the last PC exclusive I have to show you for now. Uh, it also runs pretty well, and Arma, like DayZ, another Bohemia Interactive game, 
is a game that will sometimes run slowly, not because of anything you've done wrong, but just because that's how the game runs for certain situations. Uh, in the single player infantry showcase, which is offline and takes place entirely on your local computer, the game runs with everything all the way up at a very, very smooth 60 FPS, and it looks and feels great. Now, as soon as you switch to something that involves a lot of ground units, things spread out over the entire map, uh, and then some air units, the frame rate, of course, is going to dip into the 30s and sometimes 40s, and that's just normal for Arma. Uh, now, I did want to see what would happen if I joined a multiplayer server, because that's honestly where a lot of people are going to spend time in Arma 3. So, I joined a Wasteland server, which is one of the most demanding and performance-intensive servers you can possibly join in Arma, and I was pleasantly surprised. My frame rate stayed above 30 pretty much the entire time, sometimes going a little over 40, which for Arma 3 Wasteland is pretty fantastic. Again, everything was all the way up except for anti-aliasing, which was on low with a little bit of FXAA. Uh, but the game still looks great, sounds great, runs great, and works very, very well on the Potato Masher. In comparing Far Cry 4, uh, unfortunately, as is the case with many 2014 games, uh, it actually runs really, really poorly on the PC, uh, but not on all hardware. It runs really poorly on NVIDIA, which is really, really unfortunate when you consider that we got this game for free as part of an NVIDIA graphics card promo. So we bought an NVIDIA graphics card and got a game that didn't run very well on NVIDIA graphics cards. This game does run fine on my AMD card, but the Potato Masher's video card is an NVIDIA GTX 760. Now, on the PC version, uh, it is noticeably better looking than the PlayStation 4 version, but not that much. Uh, there are more specular highlights, uh, there are more particle effects, uh, the textures are a little higher res, the models seem to be a little higher res, but you will notice a lot of micro stutter going on, where the game just freezes up for a second, or a quarter of a second, or a tenth of a second. Occasionally it froze up for over two seconds. And uh, as of mid-December, when I'm recording this audio commentary, it has still not been fixed. I'm sure it will be fixed at some point, but I have to report on the game as it is uh, when I'm looking at it, and it does run better on the PlayStation 4. And honestly, the game looks good enough on both systems that you're not really losing if you pick the PlayStation 4. It's not like you're losing a ton of visual fidelity, and the game will run smoothly, so I probably would have to recommend playing this on a PS4 right now. But if you have a PC and you bought a copy of Far Cry 4, I'm sure they will iron out the issues, give it a little bit of time. Uh, if you have an AMD card, you'll probably never experience any of these issues. But uh, yeah, this game does look pretty great on both systems. Uh, on the PS4, it's pretty obvious that the ground cover is more sparse, there's less grass, there are fewer rocks, there's just fewer everything on the ground. But it does run smoother. Uh, on the PC, like I said, there are more specular highlights, which means like the gun looks shinier, if you've noticed. Um, there's lots more things in the ground. The models all appear to be a little higher res. Now I'm running this on a mixture of high and ultra settings, a couple things on medium, like some of the shadows. And when the game runs smoothly, it looks great, uh, a little better than the PS4 version, and it runs great. Um, but it doesn't run great most of the time, so you kind of have to balance that out. Uh, but as you can see, if you're having a hard time keeping track of which version's which, it's not just you. I mean, I played through both of these and I really felt like when I was playing it that the PC version on the Potato Masher was a lot better, but as I'm going back and comparing the footage, there really wasn't that big of a difference. I can tell the difference is there, but if you told me going in that I, and I had no way of telling which one was a console and which one was a PC, I don't know if I'd be able to pick them out just based on the visuals. So that's good, actually. Um, now, I don't know if you should mark my words or not, but the fact that the PlayStation is built off AMD hardware might have something to do with the game running well on AMD hardware and not well on NVIDIA hardware. I hope this doesn't become a trend, uh, but if it does, I don't know, maybe you'd be better off having an AMD graphics card. But I think it's way too early to tell that. It's just in this particular game, in this particular scenario, uh, if you have an AMD graphics card, you'll be much better off. Um, but yeah, that's really it for all the big visual differences in between the two versions. I mean, you really can't go wrong. It's an awesome looking game. Um, I mean, there are the traditional console shortcomings, like there isn't as much anti-aliasing on the console. Um, all the textures, especially at different at distance, are a bit poorer. 
Uh, all the models are just a tiny bit simpler. Um, but that's it. That's really the only disadvantages to playing the game on the PlayStation 4. And like I said, uh, it is going to run smoother, so you really can't go wrong if you decide to play this on either platform. But if you have an NVIDIA graphics card, I would definitely wait until the game receives a couple more patches. Assassin's Creed Unity is a bit of an interesting game. Ubisoft has not had a great year when it comes to launching really good games that worked well upon release, and Assassin's Creed Unity is probably the worst. It ran absolutely horribly when it first came out. I mean, there's no way to dance around it. On both consoles and on the PC, this game was just a wreck. Frequent frame rate dips down to the single digits, texture pop in, random game freezes and crashes. Uh, the patches that came out in the first couple of weeks for this game fixed hundreds and hundreds of issues, and it does run quite a bit better now, but it's still not perfect. Now, Assassin's Creed Unity was also part of a little bit of controversy in that on the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One, the game ran at 900p, upsampled to 1080p. And then on the PC, you can of course run it at whatever resolution you want. Now, what I find interesting is that on the PC, 900p if I set the resolution to that manually, it actually looks a little bit worse than the PlayStation 4, so it's obvious that they do a little bit of anti-aliasing or something on the PlayStation 4 version. They're getting a little bit of extra performance out of the 900p version, uh, but I'm not really sure what they're using it for, because whatever they're using it for, it makes me wonder why they don't just use that to bump the game up to 1080p. I'm sure there's a good reason, uh, but I can't see what it is just from playing the game. And why that doesn't really make any sense to me is that there is a very noticeable difference between the PC version and the PlayStation 4 version. On the Potato Masher, the game runs at 1080p, no problem. Uh, well, the game runs with plenty of problems, but those are the game's fault and not a fault of the resolution. Now, I'm able to maintain an easy 30 plus FPS with everything set to pretty much the highest settings. Um, now, I did turn anti-aliasing down from the highest settings just because that drains a whole lot of performance for not a big visual difference. It's running on medium for anti-aliasing, uh, but pretty much everything else is set to the highest settings and the game runs at 30 to 40 FPS most of the time. Now, if you turn those settings all the way down, uh, the game doesn't actually run really that much better at all. And unfortunately, that's the case with most things when it comes to this game. The game just runs poorly. It can look quite beautiful at times, and at other times the poor texture work and pop in and frequent freezes and hitches make the game look actually pretty bad. But the game has serious optimization issues. To illustrate these, here is the game running at 720p. Uh, it looks pretty crappy. You should be viewing this in full screen at high quality settings if possible, but you notice the uh, frame rate keeps hitching and freezing and the overall frame rate is just a little bit higher than it is at 1080p. Well, yeah, that's the game. It just runs terribly. So after trying 720p and seeing that I couldn't hit 60fps, here I am trying the game at 900p. Uh, this is 900p with everything set to pretty low settings, just trying to crank a lot of performance out of it. I think it looks very comparable to the PS4 version, except the PS4 version is noticeably using some anti-aliasing. And now here is the optimized settings I used on the PC. It's 1080p, most everything on high, looks considerably better than the 900p low settings version. Of course, having a sunny day and the game's weather didn't really hurt. Um, but it runs about the same in performance, which again is the game's optimization issues rearing their ugly head. Now on the PlayStation 4, uh, more disadvantages are in crowds. The number of people in crowds and their behavior seems to be fewer and dumber. Um, there are a lot more wooden characters standing around, a lot less movement. Uh, on the PC version, there are a lot more people in the background, uh, considerably thicker crowds, although all of the NPCs seem to be kind of dumb anyway, so I'm not really sure you can claim a big victory for the PC, but if you got excited by seeing the giant videos of the huge crowds when they announced Assassin's Creed Unity, uh, the crowds are bigger on the PC. So again, I, I don't really know why that would be a significant thing for you, but if it is, uh, the PC is the way to go. Now, on the PlayStation 4, the lighting is pretty good. There are fewer dynamic lights than there are on the PC. 
but there still are some dynamic lights. Um, there's still pretty good texture work on everything but things at distance, although it is noticeably worse than the PC, but not really by that much. It's pretty comparable to medium textures on the PC, I think, based on what I can tell. Um, really, the only thing that makes the PlayStation 4 version actually look bad is the fact that it's running at a lower resolution, and that still just doesn't make sense because it runs decently after a whole bunch of patches at 900p, so maybe they will get a patch that bumps the game up to 1080p, who knows. Now, you may be watching this video and thinking, man, that's a whole lot of gameplay that doesn't involve somebody in an assassin suit. Well, you would be right. I didn't actually hop into the assassin suit until probably three hours into the game. Uh, so I didn't play three hours in on both systems. I just played on the PC for my own personal playthrough. So I've only recorded about the first hour and a half of gameplay, if you're wondering why there's no assassin running around. But you do still get to see the outside and the city and everything looks pretty and yada yada yada, so I didn't think it was that big of a deal for the video. So here's just a few more comparison shots. Um, you can see both versions look decently good. They run pretty poorly. Uh, and the PC is noticeably better, and that's really all I can say about Assassin's Creed Unity. Um, I don't really know if I would recommend picking it up at all. Um, you know, I would like to end this comparison by saying the definitive version is X, so the definitive version is B, but I don't really think I can say that. It definitely looks better on the PC. It definitely runs poorly on both systems. So if you absolutely have to play Assassin's Creed Unity, uh, my recommendation is to just get it for whatever system you currently own, and if you own both a PlayStation 4 and a PC, run it on Redbox for your PlayStation 4 so you can return it very, very quickly. And if you really, really want the definitive Assassin's Creed experience, my recommendation is to play Assassin's Creed Black Flag, which is an actual good-looking Assassin's Creed game that runs at a buttery smooth 30 FPS all the time on both systems and it's just a ton of fun, and I will be doing a comparison video between the Potato Masher and the PlayStation 4 of this game as soon as I can find somewhere where I can rent the PlayStation 4 version. Metal Gear Solid 5 uh, is a very interesting game to compare on the Potato Masher because it is a PlayStation exclusive originally, or the Metal Gear Solid games have been kind of unofficial PlayStation exclusives for a very long time. Many of the games have only been released on PlayStation platforms, and they have always pushed the platform visually. So you would expect that, if nothing else, the PlayStation 4 version would look excellent, and it does. Uh, and you'd also expect that the PC version would probably not look a whole lot better just because uh, they initially developed for the PlayStation as a PlayStation exclusive. Uh, so why would it be any better on the PC? And that's largely the case. Now, fortunately, this game looks awesome on both systems. It runs awesome on both systems. Uh, on the PC, there's a really nice feature. There's a 30 FPS V-Sync for people who probably can't hit 60 but still want the smoothness that V-Syncing gives you. Uh, you can do it at 30 FPS, which is really, really cool. And then the other options on the PC, really, even if you turn them all the way up, it's not going to look a ton better than the PlayStation 4. I would put the PlayStation 4 at very high and the PC at ultra if you turn everything up. Actually, the biggest difference between the PC and the PlayStation 4 was that on the PC, you can set the depth of field to be a lot thinner, and I did that because I kind of liked how it looked. And uh, that's a little more noticeable than really anything else. I mean, the textures look like they're maybe 5% better. The models don't look any different. The anti-aliasing doesn't really look different. Um, there aren't really any aliasing issues on the PlayStation 4, and it just looks great on both platforms, and that's good. Uh, I really, I should have less to say about more games. Uh, unfortunately, what I've been finding out with the Potato Masher so far is that the problem isn't usually the way the games run or look on any one platform, it's how the games run and look overall. Uh, many games that have come out in the past year have had serious, serious issues, and it's really nice to play what used to be a platform exclusive and is now a multi-platform game that runs so well on both systems uh, and is a lot of fun to play. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes, of course, is just a preview of the full-length Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Pain, which is coming out uh, sometime soon in the next year or so. Now, I will say uh, any major differences on the PC besides the visuals, it, the game does feel a little faster. If you watch me playing both of these, it'll look like the game is running a little bit quicker on the PC. It's locked at 30 FPS, so I don't know if Snake is able to move a little faster on the PC, or it could just be my imagination, uh, but 
it certainly does feel like the PC is a little more fluid. Um, now, I, I don't, again, I don't really know what to make of that because there wasn't anything I was consciously doing differently. Uh, it could be just slight differences in the way I played the missions, uh, but there you go. Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes. Really, really awesome game so far. I'm greatly enjoying it, and I would highly recommend it. It looks great and runs great. You can't go wrong on any system. I might actually buy uh, the Phantom Pain on the PlayStation 4 just for old times sake. I've always played Metal Gear games on the PlayStation platform and there's no real visual reason to choose the PC unless you want the ability to run at 60 FPS, 120, whatever. Uh, then yeah, you'll want to play on the PC, but other than that, you really can't go wrong on either platform. Up until now, we've mostly been comparing AAA games, and the reason for that is that's most of what people play on consoles, right? Well, no, not really anymore. With PlayStation Plus and a little bit of the Xbox Live Gold, whatever it's called, program, indie games are becoming more and more popular on video game consoles, and the PlayStation platform has actually been really excellent about this. And PlayStation Plus is one of the ways they do it, uh, by offering a couple free games a month, for each of their platforms, uh, they do a good job of promoting indie games. And uh, one indie game that is extremely popular is the Trine series, Trine and Trine 2. And I thought we ought to at least have one indie game comparison in this video. Not just because indie games have become more and more popular on both platforms, uh, but because if you are building a $350 computer, if you are gaming on a bit of a budget, chances are you're going to play a lot of indie games. In Humble Bundles and Steam sales, you can get indie games for incredibly cheap on the PC. PlayStation Plus is a pretty decent deal, uh, but it still can't match up to Steam sales and Humble Bundles, Indie Bundles. I mean, there's like a million bundles on the PC. If you want to get indie games, it's very, very easy to do. So chances are you're going to play quite a few indie games, or at least try them, and you ought to know how well they would run on a $350 computer. Well, they run great. The great thing about indie games is most of them aren't that resource intensive. Uh, now, not only do they run great on the PC, they run great on the PlayStation 4 for the same reason. Trine 2 appears to be running at 30 FPS and 1080p on the PlayStation 4. I'm not able to confirm that, uh, but it certainly appears to be full native resolution on a 1080p screen, and uh, it appears to be running at 30 FPS. And it, uh, it looks great! In fact, the only real visual difference I can tell between the PC and PlayStation versions are uh, a little bit of aliasing on the PlayStation 4, which is just par for the course, if you've seen in the other games. Uh, but that's about it. Now, it's worth mentioning on the PC, I'm actually playing this at 4K using NVIDIA Dynamic Super Resolution, trying to, on the PC, is running it at 4K locked to 30 FPS just because I think it looks great. Uh, it makes the aliasing issues that are present on the PlayStation 4 pretty much go away, uh, and it looks fantastic. Now, you're not gonna be able to tell a huge difference between 4K uh, on PC and 1080p on the PlayStation 4, mostly because the game just has a really, really awesome art style to start with, and resolution is not that necessary to make the game look fantastic. The art style and the lighting and the colors and everything else, they make the game look fantastic, which is great. More games should be like that. Um, you know, I think it's awesome anytime a game looks great and runs great on every platform it's available on. The only reason I ran the PC at 4K was just because I could, and it does make the game look a little bit better, so if you've got the performance, why not? But rest assured, you could probably run this at 120 FPS at 1080p if you wanted to. I mean, this is a, a pretty lightweight game, it runs pretty well. Um, and of course, if you have a really, really old computer, it, it may not, but for anything of the Potato Masher's level, anywhere close to that, you will have no trouble running Trine 2, and by extension, most indie games. So, this is a, a pretty awesome game if you've never played it, runs great on both platforms, and you should definitely check it out. Alien Isolation is a pretty awesome game, and I don't just mean visually, although it is pretty awesome visually. Uh, it's a really atmospheric, creepy, not quite survival horror kind of puzzle action uh, story driven game, and it's really, really cool if you like the Alien universe. If you don't like the Alien universe, it'll probably be a little confusing, but you can still enjoy it as an adventure survival horror game. Now. 
On the PC and the PlayStation 4, this game looks fantastic. On the PlayStation 4, the game appears to be running at 30 FPS and full 1080p resolution, uh, which is great. It's one of the few AAA games this year that doesn't seem to have any performance issues on the next-gen consoles. Uh, on the PC, I could very, very easily run it with everything on Ultra Settings at 60 FPS locked. Uh, and as you'll see a little later in that video, we could even run it better than 1080p. Uh, but on the PlayStation 4, it looks great. The only thing that looks a little weird, and I noticed this on the PC at 1080p as well, is that there appears to be aliasing issues on certain objects in the distance, and I think it's something to do with the game engine, because even when I turned on anti-aliasing all the way up on the PC, I still noticed this phenomenon to a certain extent. So I think it's just the way the game engine handles uh, edges, but the game engine's fantastic overall. The lighting model's beautiful, the people look great. Um, you know, there's not really many issues except for that one thing. And I would say on the PC, the fact that you can turn up anti-aliasing does help compensate for this issue somewhat. Now, uh, on the PC, the main graphical advantages are that there are more individual light sources, uh, the shadows are higher resolutions, and there appears to be a bit more contrast in the overall image. And I don't know if this is a stylistic choice or just kind of the way it worked out, having the higher graphics options on the PC, but either way, it looks great on both systems, but the PC is definitely a little bit better. Now, just for grins, I decided to turn the PC up to 4K using NVIDIA Dynamic Super Resolution, where it renders at 4K and then downsamples to 1080p. Uh, and as you can see, it looks and runs pretty great. It runs at 30 to 40 FPS at 4K uh, with everything on pretty much high. When you go to Ultra, there appears to be a little bit of an optimization issue, and the game would still run at 30 FPS, but it would sometimes dip down to the low 20s. So just to avoid that experience, uh, I turned everything to high slash ultra, and I turned uh, anti-aliasing down to just FXAA, because when you are rendering things at a very high resolution, that takes care of a lot of the reasons why you need anti-aliasing, as I've mentioned before in other Potato Masher videos. Uh, so at 4K, this game looks even better. Um, the little bit of the aliasing issue seems to go away. Everything gets sharper, the textures look better, uh, the models look better. Heck, even the lighting looks better, which doesn't really make a lot of sense, but uh, NVIDIA's Dynamic Super Resolution and AMD's Virtual Super Resolution features are really, really awesome, and if you have extra performance overhead in your computer, I recommend you try them. Uh, overall, Alien Isolation is great on both platforms. You honestly, you can't go wrong. It looks great, it runs great, uh, it's a fantastic experience, but on the PC, it definitely is better. Being able to play at 60 FPS or at 30 FPS at 4K just makes the game look fantastic. Uh, now, if you think it looks great on the PlayStation 4 or if it looks great just at regular 1080p on the computer, great. There's no reason why you should have to get it on one platform or the other, but in this case, the Potato Masher definitely is the superior experience. Well, if you've made it this far in the video, you're probably wondering what conclusions, if any, we can draw from what we've seen so far. Well, the first thing I would say is I'm extremely impressed with how well the Potato Masher has done. We were very confident that it was going to be able to play pretty much all modern games without any trouble, and it is. Uh, except for, of course, games like Far Cry 4 and Assassin's Creed Unity that have problems in the games themselves. But uh, what I was really surprised by was how well it can actually play those games. Uh, there are several games we were able to play at 4K resolution at very playable frame rates with everything on high or higher settings, uh, which is pretty amazing. Again, this computer costs $350. Uh, now, there are gonna be things that we're gonna have to keep an eye on in the future. For right now, the CPU isn't really being pushed that hard. It was at 60 to 70% in most games. That could go up a little bit as this console generation goes along, but I'm not super worried about that. Uh, it's also a quad core, so as games become better at using multiple cores, it should also perform very well. We did have to sacrifice a little bit and only stick with four gigs of memory, as if you'll remember from the parts list. Now, that's not a big deal right now. Uh, I did check a lot of these games that I tested, and most of them use between 750 megabytes and a gig and a half of memory. And Windows uses about another 750 megabytes to a gig. So we were really only using 50 to 70% of our memory at any given time. That's not bad, but that could definitely go up as time goes on and games get more memory intensive. 
we have two gigabytes of video memory on our graphics card. So we only have six gigabytes of memory total for the whole system compared to eight gigabytes for the PlayStation 4. So it will be interesting to see how that ages, uh, but I think it's gonna be fine for at least a few more years. You'll also notice from the video that I used an uh, Xbox 360 controller a couple times. The reason for that was uh, I just had one laying around. You could definitely play all these games with a mouse and keyboard, but I used the controller for trying to just because I like playing platformers with an Xbox 360 controller. And those are about 20 bucks used if you wanna get one. Uh, overall, I'm very, very impressed. Uh, there are no major issues with the build. We did our research right and everything works great. I'm pretty confident that someone else could build more or less this build, you know, depending on what parts you could find and stuff, you could build more or less this build uh, for about the same amount of money if you had a couple weeks to keep an eye on sales and to keep an eye out for rebates and things like that. So I think this is very doable. Uh, if you can build a computer, you can build the potato masher. Uh, and if you can follow simple directions on the internet and maybe have a techie friend you can call with questions, you can build a computer. They're really not that hard. There aren't that many parts. Uh, it's a very, very doable thing. So. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, there's gonna be a lot more game comparisons coming as new games come out. As I check games that have come out in the past year or so on the PlayStation 4, I'll be comparing those as well. Um, I'm hoping to put out at least a couple a month, but we'll see how it goes. It also depends on how many games are coming out at any given time in the year. But feel free to ask any questions you might have about any of our testing methodology or any of the major decisions we made. Uh, we're not trying to hide anything or get away with anything. We are trying to be as transparent and open as we can about what an easy and fun experience this can be and uh, above all else let me just re reiterate what I said earlier in the video the point of this is not to rag on the PlayStation 4 it's not to say it's an inferior platform it's not to say it sucks and you shouldn't play it uh, the point of the potato masher is to show that you can get an equal or better experience for the same amount of money. Uh, and that's not even factoring in how much cheaper PC games normally are if you buy them on sales, uh, the fact that you don't have to pay to play online, uh, lots of things like that. The PC can end up being even a much better deal. So we are very excited about the Potato Masher. We very much look forward to seeing what happens with it in the future. And thank you guys for watching.